November the 9th, 1977. President Anwar Sadat addresses a packed Egyptian People's Assembly. It was an annual address, but nobody was prepared for his announcement. So that was, he was a complicated man, but he did every now and then take a big jump rather than a little one. And Sadat was taking a leap of faith when he landed at Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv on November the 17th, 1977. As he stepped into the spotlight with the whole world watching, the Egyptian president demonstrated his increasing flair for publicity. Since its invention, the video camera was used to broadcast events, but to force all the cameras in the world to follow you while you are doing something so new, that was genius. Sadat was something of an actor. He loved to be on the world stage. and He loved to play the roles. And people said he used to want to be an actor on the stage, and this was the biggest stage in the world. Having endured a period of enormous unpopularity as president, Sadat was now reveling in his new title, the Peacemaker. Bismillah. Sadat's speech in the Knesset emphasized the concept of comprehensive peace in the Middle East. I have made myself clear. I do, I, I'm not at all aiming at uh, a bilateral agreement between me and Israel or an is Egyptian-Israeli settlement for the problem because it is not a, a, an Egyptian-Israeli problem, it is an Arab problem. But putting words into action would prove far more challenging. His negotiating counterparts were some of Israel's most hard-line right-wing politicians, headed by the Prime Minister, Menachem Begin. Sadat did not understand how hard it was going to be. He really thought it was going to be easy after he broke what he called the psychological wall. The peace effort suffered many setbacks. But under American sponsorship, President Jimmy Carter invited Egyptian and Israeli representatives to Camp David in September 1978. The talks dragged on for a fortnight without a breakthrough. But as the clock ticked, Sadat began to give ground. He had to choose between declaring his historic initiative as a failure or to accept peace with, with Begin on these terms. And I think Carter put much, a lot of pressure on him to accept these terms. And these terms meant betraying the Palestinian people. For Sadat's foreign minister, Ibrahim Kamil, this betrayal was unforgivable, and he refused to take any further part in negotiations. He resigned a matter of hours before the deadlock was broken, leaving the president solely responsible for making a bilateral peace agreement with the Arab world's sworn enemy. Sadat so uh, was very clear that this was the first step. If we insisted uh, that we get the agreement of the, uh, all the Arab uh, countries, we would not be able to get that. Salam, shalom, and to peace. By now, Sadat was more convinced than ever that the destiny of the Middle East lay in American hands. But Sadat's beloved Egypt was ostracized from the Arab world expelled from the Arab League that it had helped form. Its headquarters in Cairo were closed down. And Sadat himself had become an outcast. The Syrian radio and TV channels went on calling Anwar Sadat a traitor, who gave up his land, who gave up his cause. These harsh accusations should never be made among brothers. We should rise above them. Of course we could differ, maybe not all agree with what Anwar Sadat did, but not be that insulting. Yet, his isolation only made him more determined to finish what he'd started. And in 1979, under the watchful eye of the US president, he finally signed the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty. Sadat was a gambler with a grand sweep of history in his 
outlook and rhetoric, uh, willing to take chances. He took an enormous gamble in signing the peace treaty with Israel, but he got what he fundamentally wanted, which was all of Sinai, without any residual Israeli presence. With this roll of the dice, Egypt's era of political and cultural dominance in the Arab world was over. President Sadat believed Egypt had to isolate itself from the Arab world and remove itself from the Arab-Israeli conflict. Sadat almost announced a kind of a regional divorce from Arabism. But within Egypt, he treated this divorce as a victory, mindful as ever of his media image. Huge government-orchestrated celebrations were held as Israeli forces evacuated parts of Sinai, according to schedule. And Sadat promised the people that they would reap the dividends of peace. He tried to appeal to popular instincts that things would radically improve and blamed all ills on the wars, defending the Palestinian cause and the Arabs. This was the beginning of a point where he misled the people for some time, but he could not fool them all the time. Presenting himself as Egypt's father figure, Sadat stressed his humble origins, often visiting the village of his birth while dressed traditionally as a man of the people. But the people themselves were now suffering as the promised economic miracle failed to materialize. Rejection of the president's policies, both domestic and international, united the previously fragmented Egyptian opposition. And just as he had done when faced with opposition from Nasserites a decade earlier, Sadat launched a crackdown, but this time on a much wider scale. It is a purge, and uh, I'm not uh, eliminating the uh, opposition like uh, some of you have seen. He spared no one, from the church, to the mosque, to the Muslim Brotherhood, to the Nasserites, the liberals and the leftists. He accused them of treason and threw them in jail. But this time, his enemies could not be silenced. On the 6th of October 1981, Sadat led the military parade in Cairo, an annual show of strength for his armed forces, a potent symbol, it seemed, of the all-powerful presidency. But four assassins, belonging to an Islamist militant group, penetrated this ring of steel. Sadat was rushed to hospital, but it would be too late. I went in the operation room and found the president lying in bed, covered. It was glaringly clear before me. I had a kind of internal conflict, making me not believe what I saw. I found myself unconsciously throwing myself on him and crying. It was a difficult situation. He was a husband, a father, a lover. He was my everything. The mourners at Sadat's state funeral reflected the path that he'd taken as Egypt's president. The presence of Western leaders including a prominent Israeli delegation, emphasized the complete absence of Arabic heads of state. The guests were surrounded by an extremely tight security cordon, one that excluded the regular Egyptian people, if any had chosen to attend. We disagree with some, with perhaps too much rapprochement with the Americans, we disagree with some of his policies, but he was a visionary. And I now must admit that uh, he saw things as we did not see. A few days later, Sadat's vice president, Hosni Mubarak, was chosen as the new president. Anwar Sadat had appointed General Hosni Mubarak, the then commander of the Egyptian Air Force, as his vice president in 1976. To some observers, it seemed a bizarre choice, but one that provided an insight into Sadat's personality. He followed the advice of Machiavelli, who wrote that you should not hire people from the elites because they can become your competitors. Hire those who are in the lower ranks because they will be very obedient and loyal. Almost 30 years later, Sadat's legacy remains in the shape of a president chosen by him and not 
by the Egyptian people.